Hi, this is David Thornburg, President and CEO of the Committee of 70. Welcome to a special Monday after Thanksgiving edition of Studio C70. And today we're uh, uh, we're going to have a actually a series of guests starting uh, to talk, uh, starting a conversation about how we respond to some of the latest uh, corruption convictions coming out of Philadelphia and what implications uh, that has for people's trust and faith in, in government. Our first guest, actually, is uh, Senator Art Haywood. Uh, Senator, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be with you. I have to uh, acknowledge, in full disclosure, Senator Haywood is my senator. <laughs> in, uh, I'm in Northwest Philadelphia. He is the uh, senator from the 4th District uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, and was elected in 2014, and has distinguished himself around a number of issues uh, uh, from housing and pushing back on gun violence to higher education uh, and a host of other things. So glad to have you with us today. Senator, let me begin with the, the big question. Uh, you, you were one of a select number of folks from the regional delegation that we uh, uh, invited to this a press conference that we had this morning at nine and I know your schedule prevented you from being with us, but uh, what would you have said if you uh, had been able to attend and uh, 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 as you stepped up to the microphone to talk about what these current convictions mean and uh, the larger question of what we need to do to maintain or restore cons your constituents' faith in the integrity of, of what you do in, in Harrisburg or what goes on at City Hall. I would have said that these convictions are unfortunately part of a long series of evidence of public corruption. When I was elected back in 2014, I ran against a candidate who had been indicted. And there are many others in the state house who have been indicted and in the state Senate. And they've been Republican, but a large number have been Philadelphia Democrats. So I think that this is another call for a higher standard of ethics for public officials, but not just the personal accountability, the rules of public engagement, the rules that govern public officials need to change to make it more difficult for this kind of activity to continue. Terrific. Let's dig into that a little bit, because that's that's where we are, is thinking forward. We're not trying to relitigate the past or this recent trial, but uh, what specifically uh, do you think would would help uh, sort of to in, in, in establishing a new set of rules for the game that would prevent these and similar kinds of transgressions from occurring? So I've got a long list, so I won't go over all of it, at least not at one time, but let me mention two things that I think would have a significant difference, make a significant difference. One, we unfortunately have a culture that permits this kind of activity. And so we need Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, Democratic and Republican leadership that will say this kind of behavior is unacceptable. The culture needs to come from our political leaders and be consistently stated so that a standard of conduct is generated. The standards of conduct are present for a number of professions. There's professional ethics for lawyers. And I'm a lawyer. I know there's standards for, for physicians and many other professions. These are all about behaving in a way that the public will trust you. So we need leadership that will establish this trust. I saw something earlier about this Philly shrug, which is like, oh, it just happens. That we must end so that it's no longer acceptable. Second, we need to look at some changes that are legislative. We do need to have these campaigns financed by the public to limit the private interest. You know, here in Pennsylvania, there's unlimited dollar amounts that you can contribute for a campaign across the state house, state senate, governor. You can get a governor $10 million, a million dollars. That is unacceptable. We need campaign finance rules so that the public finances it and begin to take some of the money out 
that I believe for some is corrupting. Yeah. Let me play devil's advocate for a second is, uh, you know, you're talking about issues that have energized the community of 70 for 117 years. So we get we get used to these conversations. But one reaction we get from public officials is they say, you know, my constituents don't care about this stuff. They want to talk to me about, you know, finding a job or uh, helping them with some issue at the state or, you know, cleaning up my block or whatever. They're not they're not concerned by these these sort of good government issues. It, do you do you agree with that or, or how do you respond to that that criticism? We face a position of being uh, heavily criticized, um, having a low reputation. I think politicians have some of the lowest reputations of any profession. And what that means is that when the public don't, when they don't trust us, and then we ask them to come out and vote, uh, that's inconsistent. I believe that individuals are concerned about having high standards of elected officials. And when they don't, they don't engage. And instead of seeing it in the request of an individual for assistance with a cleanup or a grant or assistance with social security, it's true, we may not see it there, but I'll tell you where we will see it. We're gonna see it in voter turnout, a 22% turnout in this last election, 9% turnouts in other elections. We're gonna see it in alienation, disengagement. One thing I share with my staff is that in the circle of elected officials, all the elected officials seem important. In the circle of the community, we're not. I go to Home Depot, no one knows me. I just left Target, no one knows me. I'm just another individual walking around trying to buy groceries or a hammer, or in this case, a world map. So we need to understand that sometimes we're big in our own environments, but in the community, our reputations are soiled. Yeah. And that leads to apathy, alienation, and in the end, lower participation when it comes to voting. Yeah. Let me try another devil's advocate uh, yeah. uh, line with you. People say, well, you know, money in politics, money's ubiquitous. It's like water running downhill. It's always going to find a way to the bottom, no matter what you do along the way. So that conveys a sense of maybe it's the Philly shrug. Like, what are you going to do? So uh, just curious your reaction to that line of thinking. So I think what we need to uh, help people see is there are states in the United States that do have greater restrictions in terms of access uh, to political money. I just call it political money. And whether they get legislation that they like more, legislation that they like less, the citizens know that their elected officials they're, they're not being bought. And I think this is one reason that citizens are voting for billionaires. Billionaires can't be bought. Multimillionaires can't be bought. And so this creates a, ten, a, a tendency to go with those who can't be bought. Tom Wolf was a good friend of mine. Couldn't be bought. Multimillionaire. Phil Murphy, New Jersey. Couldn't be bought multimillionaire. Donald Trump couldn't be bought. Maybe a billionaire or not, we really don't know. But nevertheless, these wealthy people create an image that they're independent. And they find, people find it attractive. So I believe that just looking at who gets elected, now the public is aware of who's independent. And the public supports those candidates that are independent. And any elected official who wants to establish that they're independent, uh, they have public financing, that goes a long ways. That's a great point you make. Uh, and uh, I'll just editorialize. It would be great if we could uh, come up with some other rationale than the fact that someone's a billionaire or a multimillionaire to establish the fact that they're in fact independent <laughs> and that they're acting in the, the public interest. That feels like the holy grail. Uh, uh, to me, so and very dangerous. Yeah, it is very dangerous because there are, let's just say, there are liabilities uh, to our democracy if we just continue to 
focus on billionaires and multimillionaires and figure those are the only folks that have the independence necessary to govern. <laughs> Very dangerous. It puts you on the spot for one second. Um, sure. You, you've had to raise money uh, for your own campaigns. Uh, have you ever been approached by somebody who made you an offer that you weren't particularly comfortable with? And and how'd you respond? Of course, I don't expect you to name names, but sure. I'm just curious how you every every elected officials had to deal with, I suspect, some variation of that situation. Yes, yeah, so I've had some offers I've had to reject uh, that I thought were unethical, but they haven't come from donors. So the unethical request can come from anyone, whether a donor or not. I have a sense of how these donations work, though, that's kind of the opposite of what you described, David. I believe that these donations make it more likely that an elected official will not take action as opposed to will take action. <laughs> I think it's more likely that an elected official will not take action that may harm a big donor. So I don't really see it as much as I've got a big donation and they've asked me for some kind of legislation, therefore I'm going to advance it. At least that's not my experience. It could be other the experience of other elected officials. I'm not, not saying that doesn't happen. It hasn't been my experience. What I find most though from talking to others is uh, there's a concern from a big donor. They don't want something to move forward. Yeah. So it's more of a uh, defensive offering than a, a something uh, offered uh, in, in return for something in the future. Yeah. I believe that is the most dominant feature of these campaign donations. And what that does is stops progressive legislation. It stops us moving our legislation into the 21st century. And it gives much more dominance to incumbents. When I say incumbents, I don't mean political incumbents. I mean, industry incumbents. It's like the fossil fuel industry. We don't want to harm them. Right? So it's much more challenging to get something new when the donors are defended through donations. I think defense is the big play from donors as opposed to an offense. Yeah. And there are troubling implications for that if we're trying to nurture new firms and small businesses and innovation and creativity that fuels our economy. So, well, listen, Senator, I know I, I told you we'd only take about 15 minutes of your time, but I want to just see if we can end on a positive note. We're just coming off Thanksgiving, which I don't know about you, but it's my favorite holiday because it causes you to stop and uh, express your gratitude for all that we have. <laughs> uh, so, so just something about in this context of ethics and integrity and the conduct of public uh, public officials. What what are you what do you see? What are you a part of that you're grateful for that you think we we all ought to be thankful for? So we've had some significant conversations in the state legislature about moving forward with gift bans at some level. And they have been advanced at a level that I haven't seen in my uh, tenure. In fact, we had a vote in the state Senate to require gift bans, and we had over 20 votes for it. And this is the first time it was even a vote to have it be considered. And so even though I know that seems small, it's one step along the way that we haven't been able to make in the past. So I'm very encouraged that they we're looking at gift bans. And the second thing I would say is there is some lobbying reform legislation that is being considered in the state Senate. Um, so I'm optimistic that we can move forward and get some legislation on under consideration. Great. Well, uh, I, I share your sense that it's even as we struggle with the ongoing challenges, we'll say, it's important to recognize that we can make headway and we can take action uh, in the future. So, well, thank you so much, Senator Art Haywood, for joining us today. And I wish you a belated, uh, happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. All right, thank you.